This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the North American Review, October 5, 1906. Chapters from my Autobiography. Chapter 3. By Mark Twain. 4. Tomorrow will be the thirty-sixth anniversary of our marriage. My wife passed from this life one year and eight months ago in Florence, Italy, after an unbroken illness of twenty-two months' duration. I saw her first in the form of an ivory miniature in her brother Charlie's stateroom in the steamer Quaker City, in the Bay of Smyrna, in the summer of 1867, when she was in her twenty-second year. I saw her in the flesh for the first time in New York in the following December. She was slender and beautiful and girlish, and she was both girl and woman. She remained both girl and woman to the last day of her life. Under a grave and gentle exterior burned inextinguishable fires of sympathy, energy, devotion, enthusiasm, and absolutely limitless affection. She was always frail in body, and she lived upon her spirit whose hopefulness and courage were indestructible. Perfect truth, perfect honesty, perfect candor, were qualities of her character which were born with her. Her judgments of people and things were sure and accurate. Her intuitions almost never deceived her. In her judgments of the characters and acts of both friends and strangers there was always room for charity, and this charity never failed. I have compared and contrasted her with hundreds of persons, and my conviction remains that hers was the most perfect character I have ever met and I may add that she was the most winningly dignified person I have ever known. Her character and disposition were of the sort that not only invites worship, but commands it. No servant ever left her service who deserved to remain in it, and, as she could choose with a glance of her eye, the servants she selected did in almost all cases deserve to remain, and they did remain. She was always cheerful, and she was always able to communicate her cheerfulness to others. During the nine years that we spent in poverty and debt, she was always able to reason me out of my despairs, and find a bright side to the clouds, and make me see it. In all that time I never knew her to utter a word of regret concerning our altered circumstances, nor did I ever know her children to do the like, for she had taught them, and they drew their fortitude from her. The love which she bestowed upon those whom she loved took the form of worship and in that form it was returned, returned by relatives, friends, and the servants of our household. It was a strange combination which wrought into one individual, so to speak, by marriage, her disposition and character and mine. She poured out her prodigal affections in kisses and caresses, and a vocabulary of endearments whose profusion was always an astonishment to me. I was born reserved as to endearments of speech and caresses, and hers broke upon me as the summer waves break upon Gibraltar. I was reared in that atmosphere of reserve. As I have already said in another chapter, I never knew a member of my father's family to kiss another member of it except once, and that at a deathbed. And our village was not a kissing community. The kissing and caressing ended with courtship along with the deadly piano-playing of the day. She had the heart-free laugh of a girl. It came seldom, but when it broke upon the ear it was as inspiring as music. I heard it for the last time when she had been occupying her sick-bed for more than a year, and I made a written note of it at the time, a note not to be repeated. Tomorrow will be the thirty-sixth anniversary. We were married in her father's house in Elmira, New York, and went next day by special train to Buffalo, along with the whole Langdon family, and with the Beechers and the Twitchells, who had solemnized the marriage. We were to live in Buffalo, where I was to be one of the editors of the Buffalo Express, and a part owner of the paper. I knew nothing about Buffalo, but I had made my household arrangements there through a friend, by letter. I had instructed him to find a boarding-house of as respectable a character as my light salary as editor would command. We were received at about nine o'clock at the station in Buffalo, 
and were put into several sleighs, and driven all over America, as it seemed to me, for apparently we turned all the corners in the town, and followed all the streets there were, I scolding freely, and characterizing that friend of mine in very uncomplimentary words for securing a boarding-house that apparently had no definite locality. But there was a conspiracy, and my bride knew of it, but I was in ignorance. Her father, Jervis Langdon, had bought and furnished a new house for us in the fashionable street Delaware Avenue, and had laid in a cook and housemaids, and a brisk and electric young coachman, an Irishman, Patrick McAleer, and we were being driven all over that city in order that one sleighful of those people could have time to go to the house and see that the gas was lighted all over it and a hot supper prepared for the crowd. We arrived at last, and when I entered that fairy place my indignation reached high-water mark, and without any reserve I delivered my opinion to that friend of mine for being so stupid as to put us up into a boarding-house whose terms would be far out of my reach. Then Mr. Langdon brought forward a very pretty box, and opened it, and took from it a deed of the house. So the comedy ended very pleasantly, and we sat down to dinner. The company departed about midnight, and left us alone in our new quarters. Then Ellen the cook came in to get orders for the morning's marketing, and neither of us knew whether beefsteak was sold by the barrel or by the yard. We exposed our ignorance, and Ellen was full of Irish delight over it. Patrick McAleer, that brisk young Irishman, came in to get his orders for next day, and that was our first glimpse of him. Our first child, Langdon Clemens, was born the 7th of November, 1870, and lived twenty-two months. Susie was born the 19th of March, 1872, and passed from life in the Hartford home the 18th of August, 1896. With her, when the end came, were Jean and Katie Leary, and John and Ellen, the gardener and his wife. Clara and her mother and I arrived in England from around the world on the 31st of July, and took a house in Guilford. A week later, when Susie, Katie, and Jean should have been arriving from America, we got a letter instead. It explained that Susie was slightly ill, nothing of consequence, but we were disquieted, and began to cable for later news. This was Friday. All day no answer, and the ship to leave Southampton next day at noon. Clara and her mother began packing, to be ready in case the news should be bad. Finally came a telegram saying, "'Wait for cablegram in the morning.' This was not satisfactory, not reassuring. I cabled again, asking that the answer be sent to Southampton, for the day was now closing. I waited in the post-office that night till the doors were closed toward midnight, in the hope that good news might still come, but there was no message. We sat silent at home till one in the morning, waiting, waiting, for we knew not what. Then we took the earliest morning train, and when we reached Southampton the message was there. It said the recovery would be long, but certain. This was a great relief to me, but not to my wife. She was frightened. She and Clara went aboard the steamer at once, and sailed for America to nurse Susie. I remained behind to search for a larger house in Guilford. That was the 15th of August, 1896. Three days later, when my wife and Clara were about halfway across the ocean, I was standing in our dining-room, thinking of nothing in particular, when a cablegram was put into my hand. It said, Susie was peacefully released to-day. It is one of the mysteries of our nature that a man all unprepared can receive a thunderstroke like that and live. There is but one reasonable explanation of it. The intellect is stunned by the shock, and but gropingly gathers the meaning of the words. The power to realize their full import is mercifully wanting. The mind has a numb sense of vast loss. That is all. It will take mind and memory months and possibly years to gather together the details, and thus learn and know the whole extent of the loss. A man's house burns down. The smoking wreckage represents only a ruined home that was dear through years of use and pleasant associations. By and by, as the days and weeks go on, first he misses this, then that, then the other thing, and when he casts about for it he finds that it was in that house. Always it is an essential. There was but one of its kind. It cannot be replaced. It was in that house. It is irrevocably lost. 
He did not realize that it was an essential when he had it. He only discovers it now when he finds himself balked, hampered by its absence. It will be years before the tale of lost essentials is complete, and not till then can he truly know the magnitude of his disaster. The 18th of August brought me the awful tidings. The mother and the sister were out there in mid-Atlantic, ignorant of what was happening, flying to meet this incredible calamity. All that could be done to protect them from the full force of the shock was done by relatives and good friends. They went down the bay and met the ship at night, but did not show themselves until morning, and then only to Clara. When she returned to the stateroom she did not speak, and did not need to. Her mother looked at her and said, Susie is dead. At half-past ten o'clock that night Clara and her mother completed their circuit of the globe, and drew up at Elmira by the same train and in the same car which had borne them and me westward from it one year, one month, and one week before. And again Susie was there, not waving her welcome in the glare of the lights, as she had waved her farewell to us thirteen months before, but lying white and fair in her coffin in the house where she was born. The last thirteen days of Susie's life were spent in our own house in Hartford, the home of her childhood, and always the dearest place in the earth to her. About her she had faithful old friends, her pastor, Mr. Twitchell, who had known her from the cradle, and who had come a long journey to be with her, her uncle and aunt, Mr. and Mrs. Theodore Crane, Patrick, the coachman, Katie, who had begun to serve us when Susie was a child of eight years, John and Ellen, who had been with us many years. Also Jean was there. At the hour when my wife and Clara set sail for America, Susie was in no danger. Three hours later there came a sudden change for the worse. Meningitis set in, and it was immediately apparent that she was death-struck. That was Saturday, the 15th of August. That evening she took food for the last time, Jean's letter to me. The next morning the brain fever was raging. She walked the floor a little in her pain and delirium, then succumbed to weakness and returned to her bed. Previously she had found hanging in a closet a gown which she had seen her mother wear. She thought it was her mother, dead, and she kissed it and cried. About noon she became blind, an effect of the disease, and bewailed it to her uncle. From Jean's letter I take this sentence which needs no comment. About one in the afternoon Susie spoke for the last time. It was only one word that she said when she spoke that last time, and it told of her longing. She groped with her hands and found Katie and caressed her face and said, Mama. How gracious it was that, in that forlorn hour of wreck and ruin, with the night of death closing around her, she should have been granted that beautiful illusion that the latest vision which rested upon the clouded mirror of her mind should have been the vision of her mother, and the latest emotion she should know in life the joy and peace of that dear imagined presence. About two o'clock she composed herself as if for sleep, and never moved again. She fell into unconsciousness, and so remained two days and five hours until Tuesday evening at seven minutes past seven, when the release came. She was twenty-four years and five months old. On the twenty-third her mother and her sister saw her laid to rest, she that had been our wonder and our worship. In one of her own books I find some verses which I will copy here. Apparently she always put borrowed matter in quotation marks. These verses lack those marks, and therefore I take them to be her own. Love came at dawn, when all the world was fair. When crimson glories bloom and sun were rife, Love came at dawn, when hope's wings fanned the air, And murmured, I am life. Love came at eve, and when the day was done, When heart and brain were tired and slumber pressed, Love came at eve, shut out the sinking sun, And whispered, I am rest. The summer seasons of Susie's childhood were spent at Quarry Farm, on the hills east of Elmira, New York, the other seasons of the year at the home in Hartford. Like other children, she was blithe and happy, fond of play. Unlike the average children, she was at times much given to retiring within herself, and trying to search out the hidden meanings of the deep things that make the puzzle and pathos of human existence, and in all the ages have baffled the inquirer and mocked him. 
As a little child aged seven, she was oppressed and perplexed by the maddening repetition of the stock incidents of our race's fleeting sojourn here, just as the same thing has oppressed and perplexed maturer minds from the beginning of time. A myriad of men are born, they labor and sweat and struggle for bread, they squabble and scold and fight, they scramble for little mean advantages over each other. Age creeps upon them, infirmities follow, shames and humiliations bring down their prides and their vanities, those they love are taken from them, and the joy of life is turned to aching grief. The burden of pain, care, misery grows heavier year by year. At length, ambition is dead, pride is dead, vanity is dead, longing for release is in their place. It comes at last, the only unpoisoned gift earth ever had for them, and they vanish from a world where they were of no consequence, where they achieved nothing, where they were a mistake and a failure and a foolishness. There they have left no sign that they have existed, a world which will lament them a day and forget them forever. Then another myriad takes their place, and copies all they did, and goes along the same profitless road, and vanishes as they vanished, to make room for another, and another, and a million other myriads, to follow the same arid path through the same desert, and accomplish what the first myriad, and all the myriads that came after it accomplished, nothing. "'Mama, what is it all for?' asked Susy preliminarily stating the above details in her own halting language, after long brooding over them alone in the privacy of the nursery. A year later she was groping her way alone through another sunless bog, but this time she reached a rest for her feet. For a week her mother had not been able to go to the nursery evenings at the child's prayer hour. She spoke of it, was sorry for it, and said she would come to-night, and hoped she could continue to come every night and hear Susie pray, as before. Noticing that the child wished to respond, but was evidently troubled as to how to word her answer, she asked what the difficulty was. Susie explained that Miss Foote, the governess, had been teaching her about the Indians and their religious beliefs, whereby it appeared that they had not only a god, but several. This had set Susie to thinking. As a result of this thinking, she had stopped praying. She qualified the statement, that is, she modified it, saying she did not now pray in the same way as she had formerly done. Her mother said, "'Tell me about it, dear.' "'Well, Mama, the Indians believed they knew, but now we know they were wrong. By and by it can turn out that we are wrong. So now I only pray that there may be a God and a heaven, or something better.' I wrote down this pathetic prayer in its precise wording at the time, in a record which we kept of the children's sayings, and my reverence for it has grown with the years that have passed over my head since then. Its untaught grace and simplicity are a child's, but the wisdom and the pathos of it are of all the ages that have come and gone since the race of man has lived, and longed, and hoped, and feared, and doubted. To go back a year, Susie aged seven. Several times her mother said to her, "'There, there, Susie, you mustn't cry over little things.' This furnished Susie a text for thought. She had been breaking her heart over what had seemed vast disasters, a broken toy, a picnic cancelled by thunder and lightning and rain, the mouse that was growing tame and friendly in the nursery caught and killed by the cat. And now came this strange revelation. For some unaccountable reason these were not vast calamities. Why? How is the size of calamities measured? What is the rule? There must be some way to tell the great ones from the small ones. What is the law of these proportions? She examined the problem earnestly and long. She gave it her best thought from time to time for two or three days, but it baffled her and defeated her, and at last she gave up and went to her mother for help. Mama, what is little things? It seemed a simple question at first, and yet before the answer could be put into words, unsuspected and unforeseen difficulties began to appear. They increased, they multiplied, they brought about another defeat. The effort to explain came to a standstill. Then Susie tried to help her mother out, with an instance, an example, an illustration. The mother was getting ready to go downtown, and one of her errands was to buy a long-promised toy watch for Susie. If you forgot the watch, Mama, would that be a little thing? She was not concerned about the watch, for she knew it would not be forgotten. What she was hoping for was that the answer would unriddle the riddle, and bring rest and peace to her perplexed little mind. 
The hope was disappointed, of course, for the reason that the size of a misfortune is not determinable by an outsider's measurement of it, but only by the measurements applied to it by the person specially affected by it. The king's lost crown is a vast matter to the king, but of no consequence to the child. The lost toy is a great matter to the child, but in the king's eyes it is not a thing to break the heart about. A verdict was reached, but it was based upon the above model, and Susy was granted leave to measure her disasters thereafter with her own tape line. As a child, Susy had a passionate temper, and it cost her much remorse and many tears before she learned to govern it. But after that it was a wholesome salt, and her character was the stronger and healthier for its presence. It enabled her to be good with dignity. It preserved her not only from being good for vanity's sake, but from even the appearance of it. In looking back over the long-vanished years, it seems but natural and excusable that I should dwell with longing affection and preference upon incidents of her young life which made it beautiful to us, and that I should let its few small offenses go unsummoned and unreproached. In the summer of 1880, when Susy was just eight years of age, the family were at Quarry Farm, as usual, at that season of the year. Hay-cutting time was approaching, and Susie and Clara were counting the hours, for the time was big with a great event for them. They had been promised that they might mount the wagon and ride home from the fields on the summit of the Hay Mountain. This perilous privilege, so dear to their age and species, had never been granted them before. Their excitement had no bounds. They could talk of nothing but this epoch-making adventure now. But misfortune overtook Susie on the very morning of the important day. In a sudden outbreak of passion she corrected Clara with a shovel or stick or something of the sort. At any rate, the offence committed was of a gravity clearly beyond the limit allowed in the nursery. In accordance with the rule and custom of the house, Susie went to her mother to confess, and to help decide upon the size and character of the punishment due. It was quite understood that, as a punishment could have but one rational object and function, to act as a reminder, and warn the transgressor against transgressing in the same way again, the children would know about as well as any how to choose a penalty which would be rememberable and effective. Susy and her mother discussed various punishments, but none of them seemed adequate. This fault was an unusually serious one, and required the setting up of a danger signal in the memory that would not blow out nor burn out, but remain a fixture there and furnish its saving warning indefinitely. Among the punishments mentioned was deprivation of the hay-wagon ride. It was noticeable that this one hit Susie hard. Finally, in the summing up, the mother named over the list and asked, "'Which one do you think it ought to be, Susie?' Susie studied, shrank from her duty, and asked, "'Which do you think, Mama?" "'Well, Susie, I would rather leave it to you. You make the choice yourself.' It cost Susie a struggle, and much and deep thinking and weighing, but she came out where any one who knew her could have foretold she would. "'Well, Mama, I'll make it the hay-wagon, because you know the other things might not make me remember not to do it again, but if I don't get to ride on the hay-wagon, I can remember it easily.' In this world the real penalty, the sharp one, the lasting one, never falls otherwise than on the wrong person. It was not I that corrected Clara, but the remembrance of poor Susie's lost hayride still brings me a pang after twenty-six years. Apparently Susie was born with humane feelings for the animals and compassion for their troubles. This enabled her to see a new point in an old story once, when she was only six years old, a point which had been overlooked by older, and perhaps duller, people for many ages. Her mother told her the moving story of the sale of Joseph by his brethren, the staining of his coat with the blood of the slaughtered kid, and the rest of it. She dwelt upon the inhumanity of the brothers, their cruelty towards their helpless young brother, and the unbrotherly treachery which they practiced upon him for she hoped to teach the child a lesson in gentle pity and mercifulness which she would remember. Apparently her desire was accomplished, for the tears came into Susie's eyes, and she was deeply moved, and then she said, "'Poor little kid!' 
A child's frank envy of the privileges and distinctions of its elders is often a delicately flattering attention and the reverse of unwelcome, but sometimes the envy is not placed where the beneficiary is expecting it to be placed. Once, when Susie was seven, she sat breathlessly absorbed in watching a guest of ours adorn herself for a ball. The lady was charmed by this homage, this mute and gentle admiration, and was happy in it. And when her pretty labors were finished, and she stood at last perfect, unimprovable, clothed like Solomon in all his glory, she paused, confident and expectant, to receive from Susie's tongue the tribute that was burning in her eyes. Susie drew an envious little sigh, and said, "'I wish I could have crooked teeth and spectacles.' Once, when Susie was six months along in her eighth year, she did something one day in the presence of company which subjected her to criticism and reproof. Afterward, when she was alone with her mother, as was her custom, she reflected a little while over the matter. Then she set up what I think, and what the shade of Burns would think, was a quite good philosophical defense. "'Well, Mama, you know I didn't see myself, and so I couldn't know how it looked.' In homes, where the near friends and visitors are mainly literary people, lawyers, judges, professors, and clergymen, the children's ears become early familiarized with wide vocabularies. It is natural for them to pick up any words that fall in their way. It is natural for them to pick up big and little ones indiscriminately. It is natural for them to use without fear any word that comes to their net, no matter how formidable it may be as to size. As a result, their talk is a curious and funny musketry clatter of little words, interrupted at intervals by the heavy artillery crash of a word of such imposing sound and size that it seems to shake the ground and rattle the windows. Sometimes the child gets a wrong idea of a word which it has picked up by chance, and attaches to it a meaning which impairs its usefulness. But this does not happen as often as one might expect it would. Indeed, it happens with an infrequency which may be regarded as remarkable. As a child, Susie had good fortune with her large words, and she employed many of them. She made no more than her fair share of mistakes. Once, when she thought something very funny was going to happen, but it didn't, she was racked and torn with laughter by anticipation. But apparently she still felt sure of her position, for she said, "'If it had happened, I should have been transformed.' transported, with glee. And earlier, when she was a little maid of five years, she informed a visitor that she had been in a church only once, and that was the time when Clara was crucified, christened. In Heidelberg, when Susie was six, she noticed that the Schloss gardens were populous with snails creeping all about everywhere. One day she found a new dish on her table, and inquired concerning it, and learned that it was made of snails. She was awed and impressed, and said, "'Wild ones, Mama." She was thoughtful and considerate of others, an acquired quality, no doubt. No one seems to be born with it. One hot day at home in Hartford, when she was a little child, her mother borrowed her fan several times, a Japanese one, value five cents, refreshed herself with it a moment or two, then handed it back with a word of thanks. Susie knew her mother would use the fan all the time if she could do it without putting a deprivation upon its owner. She also knew that her mother could not be persuaded to do that. A relief must be devised somehow. Susie devised it. She got five cents out of her money-box, and carried it to Patrick, and asked him to take it downtown a mile and a half, and buy a Japanese fan, and bring it home. He did it, and thus thoughtfully and delicately was the exigency met, and the mother's comfort secured. It is to the child's credit that she did not save herself expense by bringing down another and more costly kind of fan from upstairs, but was content to act upon the impression that her mother desired the Japanese kind, content to accomplish the desire and stop with that, without troubling about the wisdom or unwisdom of it. Sometimes, while she was still a child, her speech fell into quaint and strikingly expressive forms. Once, aged nine or ten, she came to her mother's room when her sister Jean was a baby, and said Jean was crying in the nursery, and asked if she might ring for the nurse. Her mother asked, "'Is she crying hard?' meaning cross, ugly. "'Well, no, Mama. It is a weary, lonesome cry.' 
It is a pleasure to me to recall various incidents which reveal the delicacies of feeling that were so considerable a part of her budding character. Such a revelation came once in a way which, while credible to her heart, was defective in another direction. She was in her eleventh year then. Her mother had been making the Christmas purchases, and she allowed Susie to see the presents which were for Patrick's children. Among these was a handsome sled for Jimmy, on which a stag was painted, also in gilt capitals the word DEAR. Susie was excited and joyous over everything until she came to this sled. Then she became sober and silent, yet the sled was the choicest of all the gifts. Her mother was surprised, and also disappointed, and said, "'Why, Susie, doesn't it please you? Isn't it fine?' Susie hesitated, and it was plain that she did not want to say the thing that was in her mind. However, being urged, she brought it haltingly out. "'Well, Mama, it is fine, and, of course, it did cost a good deal. But—but— but, why should that be mentioned?' Seeing that she was not understood, she reluctantly pointed to the word dear. It was her orthography that was at fault, not her heart. She had inherited both from her mother. Mark Twain End of chapter 3